Muy buenas tardes, muchas gracias por estar en sintonía del Facebook Live de Onda UNED y de la transmisión de Onda UNED por eh, Costa Rica Radio 101.5 FM. Hoy tenemos el gusto de contar con la presencia del doctor, del doctor Pri, Paul Prinsloo. Él es investigador en aprendizaje a distancia y abierta del Departamento de Negocios de la Universidad de Sudáfrica. Así que tenemos un invitado de otro continente, del cual escuchamos muy poco, así que es un gusto tenerlo por acá, este, y pues vamos a conversar con él en inglés, así que a partir de este momento eh, cambiamos a inglés para conversar. Eh, hello Mr. Paul, welcome to our broadcast at ondaonet.com. Um, so, you, uh, I was telling to the people that you come from such a, 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 a continent that we almost never hear about. Okay. So it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, tell us a little bit of what's the context of what's happening in South Africa in terms of higher education. You have huge discussions at the moment of what the role of higher education should be, didn't you? Yes, thanks Sebastian and thank you for the opportunity. I think uh, to understand where we are today, one has to, to understand where we've been and I think South Africa went post-apartheid through a very, very... Shall we start over? No. Are, are we Go okay? On. Yeah, so um, we went post-1994 post, post 1994 was, was a seminal moment for South Africa. And that meant that we addressed many of the legacies of apartheid and even colonialism. And many of these things will take some many years to come. So I think if, if there's a one defining characteristic of where we are today, it's in dealing with the legacy of apartheid and even colonialism. Structurally, I don't think we will erase poverty and inequality in my lifetime and possibly in the persons in the, in the generation after me. Because the apartheid as well as colonialism really entrenched certain injustices and in inequalities that is intergenerational that there's people that have been poor for the last four generations. And so, so we, we're really grappling with, with huge unemployment. Um, our official statistics um, show an um, unemployment rate I think, of about close to 30%. And that's 30% of, of, of the population has stopped looking for work, work for employment they've given up. And, and so, so what do they do for a living? They do inform, they, I can't even say they do informal jobs, but they survive on, we have a system of social grants and unemployment benefits if they were fortunate enough to have been employed with that type of benefits. And then we have, a, and many of our families live f uh, or are dependent on the old age pensions of the grandparents in the family. So it's the grandparent receiving, I guess, a very small pension yes. that is supporting the rest of Three the very many that, kids and, yeah. and kids of the kids. So, so unemployment is a huge concern. Um, with that unemployment rate, we have our crime rates are really high, uncomfortably high, um, and certain forms of crime uh, depend on on the type of location and whether it's a more rural area or more city. I think the, the other aspect that is really impacting on, on where we are today is the fact that I think yesterday South Africa went into an economic recession. So our growth rate for the last, since forever, has never been above 3% and declining. Now it's negative. So with already 30% of the people are being unemployed. This going into a recession will not be good news for us. And, and is that like more of a continental thing? Or is it, as, oh. because we always see South Africa as one of the most developed countries mm. in the African context. Is that true? How is it going? It's, it's very interesting. I, I think we have the best, I hope, yeah, I think I, I, I will be correct to say we have some of the best infrastructure on the African continent. Um, but then I think Nigeria has surpassed South Africa in being the biggest economy. 
Mm. So uh, the other countries in, in, on the African continent don't face the same unemployment rates. They don't do, they didn't have apartheid. They didn't have that structured and structural inequalities. So, and then that brings me to, to a higher education. So for many years, um, the black or the non-white population in South Africa didn't have access to higher education or when they had access to higher education, it was to second rate, very rural universities that were not equally as, f as funded on the same rates as the privileged universities. So um, UNISA, the university where I'm currently located, we were um, founded in 1873, so which makes us a very old university. We were an examining body in 1873, then we became a distance education institution in 1946. And for many of our students, or for many of the populations in South Africa, like now Nelson Mandela is one of our famous graduandi. Mm -hmm. UNISA was the only institution through which they could study. So that was, and an, they had a similar role as we would have here in UNED, which is mm -hmm. the, the sort of university where people that live very far and has mm. very few opportunities would study through. Mm. Yes, absolutely. So we attracted students that didn't have an, the same opportunities elsewhere, the same funding. We were cheaper. We still is the cheapest. Where our admission requirements are very different and most probably the lowest. In the South African context, you have to have admission to university uh, on the based on your school leaving certificate whether you can study for a certificate or a diploma or a degree so um, but with that as a minimum basis we have about 350,000 students uh, which is a huge amount what we increasingly see is that Though working students, students with employment now, we already know that's a very small segment of the population. So while these students still form the majority of our student population, we see an increasing number of student, younger students coming into UNISA that they're not employed. They see the degree as their way into employment. They have the expectations that this is a university. They want to feel like they're on campus. Uh, while we are distance education institutions, so so we have about um, seven to ten thousand students on campus every day. There's no classes, but they want to study in venues. They most yeah, probably so they are not trapped in the environment where they come from. Yes, yeah, so the, many of them would move to. We have regional centers throughout South Africa. They would move closer to one of these regional centers and then have access to the library and study centers and to other students because they feel isolated. Yeah, without the presence of those. Yeah, so, so, so I think what we, outside of that context, so we have a huge need for higher education in South Africa. They talk about the... How, how, do you know how, oh how, my goodness. what percentage of people has higher education in South Africa? Oh, I, I don't know know from the top of my head. I'm sorry, I should have come more prepared. No, 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 no <laughs> not at all. Um, what is the total population of South Africa? Oh, I think 52 million. 52 million. So it's, yeah, it's, it's about, if we compare its size and population of students, it's about the same as yeah. the relationship between the amount of students UNED has in Costa Rica okay. versus the population of Costa Rica and the same thing with South Africa. Interesting. We have 32,000 students, more or okay. less, and we have 5 million people. You well, have, yeah, have so 350,000, you have 50 million. So it's 10 times, yeah. 10 times wow. UNED. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and I think because so many students want an access to higher education, that raises the issue about and we, we've had student protests in South Africa since uh, 2000 and when we 2015, where students demanded free higher education. How that actually started that uh, there's a, a uh, an arising activism amongst our student population and a raising awareness of increasing awareness of the impact of apartheid and colonialism and how many of our curricula are still very Western-based or Global North-based 
or based on texts from the global north. So students in 2015 took to the street to say we want the curricula to be transformed. We want African uh, curricula. We want African philosophers. We want African historians. We we want to we want that to be included in the curricula, and that was a very very well organized student protest, but also very brutal. They they wanted some monuments to be removed, and they literally removed some monuments from the colonial era, which I think is good. Um, but what we saw then but that also meant burning libraries and things yeah, like that. Didn't yeah, it? because when once a group of any people start to move, there's very little control and there's very there's huge frustration amongst our young people. So I understand the frustration. So when when a group then acts on being frustrated for so long and being angry for so long, then then things happened like libraries being burned or artworks being burned, um, which we all regretted at the end. And even they, some of them would have regretted at the end and expressed uh, their apologies. But at that moment, that is what happened. That was their claiming back the university from, from people that they considered to be foreign to the African context. Yeah, because it's, that's... Colonialism is still something Costa Rica has very back in mm. our history. Like, mm. So for us, it's very hard to imagine how mm. is it like to mm. still have a society be divided between black and white mm. in a way, or mm. West and African mm. sort of division. You also talked about being what, what your role is being a white scholar in mm -hmm. Africa. Mm -hmm. So maybe explain a little bit about this, this discussion that is also there of, of oh, yeah, that, being that's white and mm -hmm. what, is it, what is white and what is black there. Mm. It's very interesting, it's even apart, what apartheid did, it classified people as European and non-European. Non-European included everyone that was not white. So that was a very crude colonial system and then when apartheid came to power in 1948 they they literally classified people based on physical features as being black or white or colored or indian and asian so that literally meant very crude measures of if your hair was very curly or your nose was big it was very brutal though that there were even kids being removed from their parents who were black and then the kid was considered to be white or the other way around. So it was a brutal system of classification. In 1994, with a new democratic uh, government, they decided to keep the classification system because they said in order to, to correct the injustices of the past, we must look at a specific category of people and those were the blacks or Africans. Now, in the philosophical discourses, uh, there's this, you have blacks and then you have blacks who are Africans. I consider myself to be African, but I'm not black. And with these activists, they would say, I cannot be act uh, African, I'm a settler. Now, my family came to Africa many generations ago from France. So in that sense, I am a settler. But South Africa was colonized by the Dutch and then the, by the Portuguese and then the Dutch and then the English mm. and then my my culture my 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 cultural group the Afrikaner we were colonized by the English and then when the Afrikaner came to power in 1948 we were the guys and the girls that entrenched apartheid so we were oppressed and then we moved from oppressed to oppressor mm. so it is a very difficult situation so so in my institution um, I acknowledge that, that I'm white, I acknowledge that I'm a settler. I would love to be acknowledged as an African scholar, I love the continent, I consider myself to be African, but I'm also white. So I have, I have a, all It's the, a very hard uh, place yeah, I have, to I, be. I, I still have all the privileges of being white. So I would enter a shop and the people in the shop would help me first, still. Um, increasingly I see, and that's very interesting, and I see where that comes from, that when I would enter a shop or a store 
and I would be first in line and I will not be out first which is a strange experience mm. <laughs> and uncomfortable but it makes sense I understand where that is coming from so despite so you have these experiences I live in a traditional white neighborhood Mm. Uh, that is more privileged. I have access to more finances because my family was white or is white and they had access to more financing. So I think when you consider my privileges that I have in, in a democratic South Africa, despite the fact that we're trying to address the injustices of the past, I'm still white with, an, with a legacy of all the privileges that I carry with me. And that would take, I guess, many, even despite Mandela, that would take generations to be cured. Now that you mention Mandela, I think it was important for us in 1994 to, to find a way of transition that would not be violent. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, there was a lot of, of, of compromises made in 1994 where things were put beneath a carpet or swept beneath a carpet and we should have addressed them then. For example, where the, where, the, where the society was open enough to change everything. I don't think we were open enough, but we were very close to a bloodbath. So there were compromises made to say, let's just move through this. But then since 1994, for example, at the moment, 80% of land in South Africa still belong to whites. 80% and it's 1994 to 2019. So in all these years, the land ownership has not changed. The land ownership has not changed. So currently in South Africa, that's a very, very uh, vibrant discussion. And the government has now decided to expropriate land without compensation. So they can now take away land from white owners without compensation, which you can just imagine the emotions surrounding that. So yes, it's a very, very interesting time to be white in South Africa. So there's a, I, I, I totally support land expropriation. I totally support economic redistribution. We have to. We, we should have done that in 1994. Mm -hmm. But it affects me personally as a white person. Of but I think it's this generation, we never paid back in one sense for the privileges and I think it just makes sense that this is happening now. I just hope we can happen. This could happen in a way that is not bloody. Yeah. And how this does this sort of this we have talked a little bit, but how how can you implement such uh, such an issue within a university? How how can you transform a university in a social context that is also changing. Mm. And what injustices could you have in just education? Mm. Mm. I think it's, it's impo uh, important to realize most of our curricula are using prescribed books that were written by white authors, white male authors from the global north. So that's a good place to start, is to say that where does do our curricula come from? and to Africanize the curriculum and to include voices from the global self. That's one thing. The other thing, 80% of professors in South African higher education are still white. Mm. Um, same but, as the land. Yeah, same <laughs> as the land. So, may or that's an interesting correlation. So, and you don't become a professor overnight. So, because of the education background and the history, very few black students did postgraduate student studies, did masters and became PhDs. Very few went through. Now we have a need for them, but it's almost too late. So a second strategy that is being done is to identify young, younger black scholars and to give them accelerated pathways through academia. To, to They must still meet the requirements, but they, they get to certain positions and leadership positions if they show potential. So that, so hopefully we can address that. Mm -hmm. And then I think thirdly, we must get, and I hope we can do that, not lose, and I say this very humbly, not lose the white expertise that we currently have in these institutions. But I think as a white scholar in one of these ex institutions, I think we must step back 
and say what expertise do you need and if they don't need my expertise they don't need my expertise i should it's not my voice it's not my time to force myself upon a system so if the institution then decides they no longer need my expertise i must find my uh, purpose for my scholarship in a different way so i think that's my personal journey that i decided my role as scholar in a particular institution in a particular context may have changed dramatically and i must find a voice somewhere else i must re redefine myself how has that gone for other white scholars <laughs> Is it no very... not not comfortably no. um a huge what I find among my peers is is people are disillusioned people are, are becoming very um, what, what you would the right word be they're becoming very sour they say oh the apartheid South Africa we must that things used to work then and they forgot it worked only for a certain part of the population <laughs> so there's there's among many white scholars uh, romanticizing of a past and a longing for a past that we will never see again um, so there's a disillusionment amongst many of them and then there's there's also the many few out of place so their expertise is no longer needed or recognized so what is left for them to do they love their teaching they love their discipline so if what 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 must i do now so, so I think there's almost a free, two free categories. Um, white scholars that have become disillusioned and very sour and very negative and just can't wait for retirement. That's that group. And I think possibly they're in the majority. Mm -hmm. And then there's, there's the white scholars that are disillusioned, but there's nothing. They haven't redefined themselves. They haven't found a place to where they can have a voice. And then there's a smaller group of scholars that said it's okay not to for the institution to no longer use me but I, I'm still used in a different place I still have a different voice I, I still haven't lost my passion for my discipline and my teaching so possibly that's where we are I hope so so we we are in a country that hasn't got that level mm. of division but as we were discussing yesterday, we come from a year where ethnic lines that we haven't found before in our mm. country are being drawn, mm. like all this religious and uh, discussion with uh, migration, for example, mm. um, for a country that hasn't faced this mm. before in such a, an obvious way. Mm. Maybe we had it, but we didn't, we didn't notice mm. it before. Mm. What recommendations can you give to, to us as a, as a people and as academia to deal with this? That's a very difficult question. Um, I think the broader context is as in, we have to understand this in the broader context of what is happening, interna happening internationally. That there is internationally there is a, a move to the center right and right there's a move to more fundamentalistic approaches. There's a very interesting, a number of years there was a book published, God is Dead. And I saw the book on the bookshelf three days, or three, three, three weeks ago, God is back. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and God is back in a big way, in the sense that suddenly where Europe has become secularized and where people were, th were talking about the end of religion suddenly religion is just making a, a comeback and it's making a comeback in a very interesting way of enforcing these many stereotypes of supporting a particular political affiliation and supporting groups that are very anti-migrant anti-gay anti female anti whatever it's, it is happening everywhere it's not it, only it, costa rica it, it's it? it's happening everywhere and 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 i'm not sure we're going to get out of that mm -hmm. there's there's no and combine that with a global recession that is most probably coming 
to... So it's also not only Costa Rica in recession. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, South Africa went into a recession yet last night. Uh, I saw this morning on the news, it's really concerned that the tech industry is going to implode, implode soon. There's a talk of a global recession with Turkey. And so I think there's a lot of uncertainty. And when you have uncertainty, people look for certainty and strong leaders. Yeah, and, and, then and lately those strong leaders tend to come from a religious conservative background. Yeah, or they conservative and they, they play the religious voting card to stay in power and they use religion in a very particular way. I think there is a, there is a role for religion uh, in, in, in this context to provide hope, to provide alternatives, to stand up for justice, to stand up for those that are downtrodden. In every religion that I know of, the stranger in the land has a very favorite position and they protect it. <laughs> So, so I think there's the churches, the imams, the all religions can play a, an amazing role to get us through this. But currently, we see the the counterpart of that. Mm -hmm. And so, finally, universities. What what is our role in this mess? <laughs> I think that's that's very interesting. We're no longer the only knowledge producers. So, knowledge is now produced on YouTube and Twitter. And Facebook, so and that's and it spreads quicker for there, it, it, <laughs> and that's a scary part. So it's it spreads quicker. It's increasingly it's generated by chatbots, by by information farms, propaganda farms, and I don't think we we understand the extent of how they operate and how that shapes our opinions. So you have that. But then you have also these big claims made by very important people about science and the veracity of science and whether, whether um, HIV cause AIDS or whether measles, the whole immunization project. Or, so you have these big public policies where these leaders then question scientific evidence. Mm -hmm. And I think their universities have, have a voice to say, this is the evidence. We will stand up for our evidence. We will verify the evidence. But also universities must go one step further to validate other claims, to interrogate other claims, to say we found this and we check other sources and it's no longer true. So almost a, universities have almost have a truth or a fact checking. Fact checking role. Yeah, yeah. And, to, to, and to claim a space. But also to, to look for alternatives, to say uh, it, capitalism has the, these effects on society and it looks possible this is an, an alternative or let's look for alternatives or let's create alternative pathways. So it's almost to, to verify truth claims and validate them, to confront them, to contest them, to, to really be rigorous in that, but also to formulate alternative mm. and to to create hope uh, and to create hope for those people that are normally excluded. I was thinking we, we are part of university media mm. and uh, UNED is getting into discussion of possibly having a TV channel and a radio station. Uh, what I know is not your area of expertise, mm. but what role have you seen, for example, university media has had in, in South Africa, for example? It, it's, it's very interesting. I, I don't know of, let me just quickly think, I, I cannot remember uh, a university that, that oh, it's a radio or a and that uses radio. We have on the African continent, we have, we've had the Mauritian College of the Air, that is now the Open University of Mauritius, that really utilize radio. There's not one university, as far as I know, that uses radio or even television broadcasts in South Africa. In South Africa, Africa it's not We have case. YouTube, we have different forms of communication, but we don't have a, a university radio station that would claim a space. My own institution has a, has a radio station, um, and it, they are used to highlight student concerns, to explain or to introduce some academic subjects to students. I, I'm not sure what the uptake of that is, 
if, if I'm in your shoes and to say if UNET is going this role, what would be your, your agenda uh, in the context of what we've just discussed? I, I would love to, to see you take an active role in confronting public display or the, the, the public speech. Uh, yeah, is, public speech. Uh, you say this was said and we spoke to the scientist and yeah. this academic and this is what is actually happening <laughs> almost to claim that space um, that space of fact check and, yeah, and, and yeah, public discussion and, yeah and to, to, to just confront injustice and uh, yeah inequality well thank you very much it's been a pleasure talking to you the time has come to an end sadly um, so we have been discussing with uh, Dr. Paul Prinsloo He's a researcher in distance learning and open learning uh, in the Department of Business of the University of South Africa. Did I say it right? You, yes. you, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you so uh, much for being with us. And uh, pura vida, Costa Rica. Uh, Muchas gracias. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, very much. Thank you very much for being with us. This has been, uh, esta ha sido una transmisión, muchas gracias por estar con nosotros. Esta ha sido una transmisión de OndaUnet.com a través de Facebook Live y también a través de Costa Rica Radio 101.5 FM. Hasta luego y continúa en sintonía de OndaUnet.